Creative Writing Program, the Writer Studio, and our Creative Writing Community. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the May edition of Lunch Poems. I'd like to start by acknowledging that I'm coming to you today from the Kite First Nations here in New Westminster. And as we do during our Zoom sessions, we'd love for you to share where you're coming in from, the name of the traditional territory that you're coming into us today in our little chat box. And the chat box is there to share good, no, good news, good vibes, good energy. And so we'd also like you to share your territory if you know it. So we're excited to be bringing you another offering of Lunch Poems. And we're honored to share great poetry and wonderful poets like Shanice, Jan Mohammed, and Michael Pryor. As always, we thank you for deciding to spend your lunch with us today. We also invite everyone to stay connected with the Writer Studio and participate in our other monthly community activities. We have our Twitter chats and sprints, which happen on Sundays. We have our community workshops on, and courses on craft. And at the end of this month, we have Joseph Kakuino Kanastam leading a session on writing emotional truths. We're also accepting applications for, yep, but we're also accepting applications for the September cohort of the Writer Studio. The program is completely online and runs from September to June, and it combines pairing students with a mentor and a live workshopping group. We have six great mentors for our September intake. Uh, we have Eileen Cook, who's doing YA fiction, Claudia Cornwall, nonfiction and memoir, Salim Nawaz, Salima Nawaz is teaching fiction, Brian Payton is nonfiction and fiction, Stella Harvey is doing fiction and personal narrative. And for our September intake, we have Rob Taylor uh, will be our poetry mentor. So Rob Taylor. We have an info, we're having an information session on May 28th. So if you've ever thought about applying to the program, it's your chance to meet the mentors and our alumni and have all your most pressing questions answered. You can find out more about all these events on our website. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to do something just a little different today if it's okay. I want to take a moment and create space for you. I love Lunch Poems because it's an opportunity to come together as a group and experience poetry together. But the reality is, is we all come as individuals. And so maybe your morning's been hard. Maybe you're feeling the weight of the past two years and everything happening in the world. And maybe you're feeling a little distracted. Whatever it is, I just want to create a moment for us to notice how we're feeling, stay with it if it's a good feeling, or move past it, just let it go if it's a feeling you don't want to stay with you. So if you'll indulge me, I would love for us to take a moment for ourselves. Let's just breathe. We'll each take in a few breaths, and after each inhale, we'll just do some, we'll slowly exhale. So you can close your eyes. Feel free to turn off your cameras while we do this. I don't like it when I think people are looking at me. But um, I just want to create a moment where we can just be present with ourselves and go into the poetry with um, you know, a clear mind. So I'll start us off. Let's begin by taking a deep breath and focus on inhaling, then slowly exhaling. Inhale. Exhale. If you don't mind doing this, we'll do this two or three more times and then it will come back. So then one final one. Okay. Thank you for doing that with me. Um, noticing my breath has helped me to be more present and in the moment and like full honesty, I'm not doing it enough these days. So today's my son's third birthday and uh, he's getting older and I find myself just trying to be with him mentally in the moment and I haven't been. And so um, uh, and generally I'm distracted thinking about work, uh, preparing for dinner, uh, or when we should be getting ready for bedtime. So I'm trying to be better at savoring the moments we have together. And I find when I focus on a few breaths, I'm better able to do that. So I just wanted to share that with you today for our lunch poems. And maybe that'll help you do the same if that's something that will help you in the future. So 
yeah, so that's it. So I'd like to thank our organizing team for their work coordinating this event. As regular attendees know, Kieran Danoa does all the behind the scenes work for Lunch Poems each month. So thanks, Kieran. Uh, the wonderful Renee Sacklecar is our visionary curator and does all the pairings. So thank you, Renee. And the wonderful Kim Gilker is our longtime host. So thank you to Kim. And uh, with that, I'd like to invite Kim to the stage, so to speak, and introduce you to this month's poets. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks for that great introduction. And thanks to you all for, for all of the support that you give us, Andrew, Laura, and Kieran. Okay, thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, we were just uh, sharing a bit of a conversation of how all the people in the East who are enjoying the beautiful weather can rub it in to all the folks out here in the West who are enjoying, and now not enjoying so much, the uh, more like winter or fall weather. Anyway, so glad to see everyone coming from all across Canada and beyond. Uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, read the bios for these two amazing poets today. Uh, the first poet to read will be Michael Pryor. Michael Pryor is a writer and teacher. He is the author of two books of poems, Burning Province, McClellan and Stewart, Penguin Random House, 2010, which won the Canada-Japan Literary Award and the Dorothy Livesey Poetry Prize and Model Discipline, Veacule Press 2016, which was named one of the best books of the year by the CBC. Pryor is the recent recipient of fellowships from the New York Public Library's Kalman Center, the Jerome Foundation, and Hawthornden Literary Retreat. His poems have appeared in Poetry, The New Republic, Narrative Magazine, Kenyon Review, PN Review, The Walrus, Poetry Daily, the Academy of American Poets Poem A Day series and elsewhere. He holds graduate degrees from the University of Toronto and Cornell University. Please give it up for Michael Pryor. Thank you, Kim, for that introduction. Um, and thank you to everyone involved with Lunch Poems at SFU, Andrew, Laura, Kieran, thank you for running everything behind the scenes and especially Renee who invited me to read. Um, thank you as well to Shanice uh, for your wonderful work. Um, it's an honor to read with you. Um, and thank you to everyone for being in the audience. Uh, before I start, I want to say that where I'm reading from now in Manhattan is the ancestral homeland of the Lenape people, um, many of whom were violently displaced as a result of European settler colonialism. And the Lenape are the rightful stewards of this land. So I wanted to acknowledge that but before I begin. Um, Today I'm gonna to be mostly reading new poems from a manuscript in progress. Uh, I've been a, a writer in residence at the New York Public Library for the last year. So I've actually had some time to write new poems. Um, and I'll end with a poem uh, from, my, from my last book, uh, Burning Province. Um, so I'd like to start by talking uh, a little about myself and my, uh, and my work, and then I'll read four poems. Um, I like to always tell people how many poems I'm going to read so you can count them off. Um, and while I'll be reading, uh, I'll also be sharing uh, my screen because I have some visuals and I'd like you to look at those in the poems rather than my face. Um, so I'm going to start by doing that. Can everyone see that? Yes? Okay, good. Um, so I'm a fourth generation Japanese Canadian. Um, and many of the questions which uh, always seemed on the peripheries of my life while I uh, was growing up are related to the forcible displacement and dispossession of Japanese Canadians during the Second World War. Um, so not long after Pearl Harbor, my maternal grandparents and their families were stripped of their possessions and properties and incarcerated in camps in the interior of BC, you know, where I grew up. Um, the same thing happened to 22,000 other Japanese Canadians in the province. In the camps, they lived in tar paper shacks without insulation, running water, or electricity. Um, and after the war, uh, Japanese Canadians were given the choice of either moving east to the Rockies uh, or being deported to Japan. And so this was essentially an attempt by the provincial government, the government to, to break up the community, to eradicate the community. Um, when I was growing up, my grandparents were reticent to talk about their experience during the war. Um, they rarely mentioned it directly. Um, and I received the sort of first stories of that time from my mother. 
Uh, but over time, as I got older, they did begin to share their memories. And these recollections became an inextricable part of my sense of family, of self. Um, so this is a camp uh, where my grandparents were kept, Tashmi, which is just past Hope in the interior. Um, if you've driven uh, Crow's Nest Highway, you've probably gone past it. These are my grandparents. Um, the picture on the left, in the top, top left-hand corner, is a portrait my grandfather's family took at Sears, I believe, right before they were sent to the camps. My grandfather's on the right-hand side there looking a little bewildered. Um, and then on the right-hand uh, side of the screen, there's my grandparents' uh, wedding photo. Um, I showed this to my grandfather uh, not that long ago, and he was like, wow, that, that haircut is not in style anymore. <laughs> So what all this translates to in my writing, I think, is a focus on intergenerational memory and cultural trauma. You know, the processes by which one inherits and often rewitness memories that aren't experientially one's own. So the first poem I'm gonna read um, is also interested in generational memory. Um, am I freezing up at all or am I okay? You okay? Okay. Um, and so this poem thinks through my relationship with my grandmother, uh, who looms very large in my life. Uh, we were close. She raised me for several years when I was young, and she fell ill and passed away when I was just writing the first poems in my, in my last book, Burning Province. Um, and her passing indelibly shaped the form that book uh, eventually took, and I'm still reckoning with her death now. Um, and it's, this kind of reckoning has forced me to think about what it means to, to elegize the idea of living memory. Like, what will it mean for like various Nikkei communities, um, you know, diasporic Japanese Canadian communities, diasporic uh, Japanese American communities, when soon there won't be anyone left who remembers what happened uh, during the war as part of their like kind of like firsthand experience. And so what then are the responsibilities that younger generations have to assume in the shaping of collective memory? Um, and my grandmother had this incredible life. Her uh, biological parents gave her away to another family while they were in the camp. And then after the war, they moved to America and then back to Japan. And my grandmother decided to stay in BC. And so she worked uh, throughout high school as a live-in nanny and cleaner for a series of white families in Vancouver who treated her rather poorly. Um, but she was, despite all that, a rather stoic person, an incredibly funny person. Um, she had infinite patience for me. <laughs> um, and after she died, she left this, this photo album. And when I opened it, after the first few pages of, of photographs, there is this incredible page of all these dried and pressed four leaf clovers. And I had this very Proustian moment. And I suddenly remembered when how when I was a kid and sometimes even as a teenager, you know, we'd sit in her backyard or in the park behind her house looking for four leaf clovers um, together. And she was a pretty superstitious person. Um, and interestingly, in Japanese culture, the word for four, she also is the word for death, and therefore the number is construed as bad luck, the same way the number 13 often is here. Um, but she really believed in luck, and uh, she often said that she thought she had a very unlucky life. Um, so this is a poem, uh, Four Leaf Clover. Night falls, and I open the album I've chosen not to open until now. At first, I don't understand why she left it to me. Polaroids of a honeymoon in Vegas, mimeographed evacuation orders, and then a dozen four leaf clovers pressed between wax paper, looking somehow less fragile dried than alive. We pick them together. Or over 20 years, I watched her comb through tall grass and parks, bathing baseball diamonds, overgrown lots, the backyard of a house they later lost to death. So tangled they rippled like water under her hands. What is luck but an endless negotiation between what one wants and will not have? Having been an orphan, having been born with a face that led to a camp, she had seen more cruelty than kindness. She saw it blossom in me. Yonsobozu, she muttered, whenever I hid Lego in my sister's shoes, shattered a snail's world home. Engimono, each time she found those four lobed leaves, the radial symmetry 
like an MRI of a dreaming brain. What she loved most about the world were its ephemeral forms. Miso's maelstrom in a bowl of stock, the bubbles blown and tumbling from a pipe cleaner's twisted loop. She, she sighed near the end, meaning four or maybe death. Blood drying in the cracks that cut across her lips and made it hard to speak. I wouldn't know. I never learned the tongue, she murmured behind closed doors. Behind those half open in my mind, her swollen limbs, the x-rays ashen ghosts. What is luck but someone else's easier history? A hand drawn from a deck rigged for regret. I am full of remorse, counting the moments I chose to forget what she had so keenly, ineffably known. Luck the iridescence marbling the bubble before it breaks. Luck, a child failing to master the future tense, an orphan shutting the door to a tar paper shack. Once, when I was eight, she bought us scratch tickets at the station and won $40. We played until there was nothing left. I've been thinking a lot about displacement during the pandemic, um, the ways in which this thing has sort of altered our connection to the people and places that mean the most to us. Uh, I, for example, haven't been home for a while um, and that's thrown into relief the frailty of my parents' age, especially as I only really see them now on the screen. Uh, and so this, this poem focuses on my mother. Um, and I think we have a, I think it's safe to say we have a complicated relationship which has a lot to do with kind of generationally how we conceive of ourselves in relation to the past. So this is a palinode, which is a poem, a genre of poem meant to apologize for or retract a previous sentiment. Palinode. My mother is stalking cabbage moths with a tennis racket. She looks most like herself when she tenses, then swings over rows of kale and romaine at the white specks floating through blue shadows. She is bisected by the swaying frame, distanced by the poor resolution of the video my sister just sent. Her left hand is bandaged, tendonitis from picking caterpillars and eggs off the leaves with chopsticks. As if to prove obsession is its own lineage, I have spent hours checking the sun-stunted shiso for iridescent beetles, bodies tufted with fine hairs like the down on a dandelion seed. Spent years wondering what it meant to be her or her parents, uprooted, dispossessed. I can see so clearly time's possession in the way I speak, like her. The preference for detail, for impossible control, how my skin has pocked and wrinkled, the first gray hairs growing up my temples. I am thinking of the time she was enrolled in an ESL class, even though she only spoke English. The time she told me on the phone that because I had left, I couldn't come back. The time I stole $20 from the jar under her bed, or all the time she corrected my pronunciation. Repeat indistinguishable, inconsolable, inevitable that I won't return home for another year. By then, she will have stopped dyeing her hair. There are no equivalencies, only echoes. I am alone and watching my mother watching something above her head. My mother is swinging and missing. My mother is crying for her mother. My mother is referring to herself as Oriental, as old. The cabbage moths arrived on the coast in the late 19th century, just before our family. Now these shimmering beetles are weighing down the leaves. When I look back, my mother has become indistinguishable from the shadows under the trees. Uh, one of the kind of significant elements in the new manuscript I'm working on, or at least I, I hope it will be significant, 
is a series of ekphrastic poems, that is poems responding to visual art. And in particular, the work of Japanese Canadians and um, Japanese American painters and sculptors who were either incarcerated during the war um, or who have responded to their parents or grandparents' incarceration. In these poems, I hope to think through how such art might not only serve as artifacts that bear witness to this particular historical moment, but also as these vessels that reframe the present and even direct their energies uh, toward the future. And so some of the artists I've been looking at include folks like Chiro Obata, Kazuo Nakamura, Ruth Ozawa, Takao Tanabe, Samu Noguchi, Lillian Nishimura. Um, but as soon as I started uh, researching all these artists, I quickly realized in order to better engage with their work, I needed to have a much fuller understanding of certain Japanese art traditions, uh, such as sumie painting or you know, uh, yukioe printing. Um, and so this last, second last poem I'm gonna read, it does make some reference to, to the art I've been looking at here. And it was inspired in fact, by a particular image of a mackerel uh, by Hiroshige, uh, the woodblock artist, um, actually the one in the, the top left corner of the screen. Um, and I wanted the poem to explore how a diaspora community mediates ideas uh, of authenticity. So what does it mean to be Japanese Canadian in this particular moment? Um, what are the markers of this identity? And why do we often insist on inscribing a sort of hierarchy to them? Of course, language is a primary marker of culture. Um, another important one might be food. And so this poem is trying to think through some of the tropes usually associated with food and language in Asian North American writing and perhaps trouble them a little. Um, you know, when I was growing up, the only Japanese words I heard, apart from like my grandmother calling me a naughty boy, uh, were like the words for various foods. Um, and my grandparents deliberately didn't teach my mother or her brother Japanese because they wanted them to assimilate and be better Canadians. Um, so this is a poem called Saba, uh, which is the Japanese word for mackerel. Saba. I point. And the fishmonger hooks two fingers inside its jaw, lifts it gently from its shell of ice, and lowers it onto the scale draped in butcher's paper. Blue flames flicker under tie green stripes. Examined closely, this mackerel is exponential. An ink block print, an expression of surprise, cirrus dappled sky. A still life's thin stemmed crystal and sliced lemon. Or, of course, a silver belly charred golden in a pan, daikon grated like a hill of melting snow. Home away from home, I run a finger over teeth fine as the burrs on a file. Watch its eyes tarnish in the apartment's dry heat and listen for the rasp as the filleting knife nudges where ribs wrap into spine. On speakerphone, a raspy cough. Then my grandfather lapses into a language I was never taught. The starts and stops of steel scraping bone, verbs and nouns balanced in absentia on the red wave of a tongue. Salt sweet, acidic, the fish tastes of the coastal shelves where it's schooled each spring. Studied closely, any word is a primer in adaptation. From the Latin, macula, meaning spot or stain on skin, or an eyes burst vessel, sallow shade, the way my grandfathers have clouded with age, the way even memories become mispronunciations. I remember the docks in Steveston, where he would lean over trays of frozen bodies fanned out like bouquets, prodding the scales and checking the sclera for clarity. Saba, hamachi, sake. How once, jokingly, he called me hafu. How, years later at a reading, a man pointed out my struggle to say my mother's maiden name. Who doesn't tire now and then? of trying to map the past and the oily flesh of a fish, the sour scent of a fruit. Strangers asking for easy authenticity, clearer origins, or why the only words you know are the words for food. The only certainty, the uncertain imagination. Pin bones bristling visible under the bevel of a blade, argent bodies plunging as one through their own refraction. 
in an izakaya, blocks from the boardwalk where I grew up. My grandfather praised my wife's flawless pronunciation. Couldn't fathom she learned it in the class. After we paid, he snagged two quarters from the change and with a loose wristed flourish, vanished them, proffer in empty hands. I knew the trick. He taught me it when I was young. I could see the overlapping silver caught between his finger and his thumb. So the last poem I'm going to read um, is the last poem in Burning Province. And um, it's sort of a love poem, the, the kind of love poem I can write, which begins with brain eating insects. Um, and it uh, takes its epigraph um, from a book of uh, fragmented essays, Zuitsu, by the Japanese medieval monk Kenko. Wakeful things. You should never put the new antlers of a deer to your nose and smell them. They have little insects that crawl into the nose and devour the brain. Kenko, Essays in Idleness. Consider that the insects might be metaphor, that the antler's wet velvet scent might be Proust Madeline dipped into a cup of tea adorned with centrifugal patterns of azalea and willow. Those flushing the hill behind this room, walls wreathed in smoke and iron, musk of the deer head above the mantle. He was nailed in place before I was me. Through the floorboards, a caterpillar, stripped from its chrysalis by red ants, wakes as if to a house of flame. Silk frays like silver horns, like thoughts branching from a brain. After the MRI, my father's chosen father squinted at the wormholes raveling the screen and said, be good to one another. Love, how inelegantly we leave how insistent we are to return in one form or another. I wish all of this and none of it for us, more sun, more tempest, more fear and fearlessness, more of that which is tempered, carved and worn, creased into overlapping planes. The way I feel the world's aperture enlarge in each morning's patchwork blur of light and color while I fumble for my glasses beside the bed lenses smudged by both our hands. When they were alive, those antlers held up the sky. Now, what do they hold? Thank you. Wow, <laughs> wakeful things. Ah, that, that was amazing. Thank you so much, Michael. Ah. I'm, uh, yeah, as always, I'm always speechless by, by the amazing poems that, that we get to hear. And, and it was interesting to see the text juxtaposed with the actual reading. Thank you so much, Michael. <laughs> Wonderful. All right, um, a transition <laughs> that's kind of difficult to make. Um, Wonderful. Uh, next poet to hear for us is Shanice Jan Mohammed. Shanice Jan Mohammed was born and raised in Toronto with ancestral ties to Kenya, Kutch, and Gujarat. She has performed her work in venues across the world, including the Jaipur Liter Literature Festival, Alliance Francaise de Nairobi, Indian Summer Festival, and the Aga Khan Museum. A poet and educator, she regularly visits schools and community organizations to teach, perform, and inspire. Her land art has been featured across Turtle Island, including the National Arts Center and the Art Gallery of Mississauga. Shanice has three collections of poetry published by Mowenzi House, Bleeding Light, 2010, Fire Smoke, 2014, and most recently, Reminders on the Path, 2021. You can find out more at ShaniseJanMohammed.com. Please give a very warm welcome to Shanice Jan Mohammed. Thank you so much. Oh, what a gift to listen to your poems, Michael. I'm just sitting with them. I think we all need a moment to sit with them. So thank you for that. And how incredible that the work that I'm doing is around 
intergenerational narratives as well. So we were meant to be in this space together, indeed. Uh, before I begin, I just want to acknowledge that I am situated in the city of Markham and want to acknowledge the traditional territories of Indigenous peoples and their commitment to stewardship of the land. We acknowledge communities in circle, the north, west, south, and eastern directions, and the Haudenosaunee, Huron-Wendat, Anishinaabe, Seneca, Chippewa, and the current treaty holders, Mississaugas of the Credit Peoples. We share the responsibility with caretakers of this land to ensure the dish is never empty and to restore relationships that are based on friendship, trust, and solidarity with Indigenous activists, water keepers, land protectors who are fighting for land back. With that, I want to share my screen as well. Seems like we both love images. Um, and hopefully you can all see this. So what do you know? We begin with our grandmothers, don't we? This is my grandmother, my mom's mom. And she was born in Kenya in a little town called Eldoret, which is close to the Rift Valley. And the last time I visited was in 2019, and it was with this objective to go and find out her stories because I realized so many of my ancestral stories were told through the patriarchs of my family, the pioneers, the ones that left India in the 1800s, just boarded a Dow and found their way into the interior of East Africa and settled. And I'm like, wait a minute, what about the women? Uh, what, and why is it that I hadn't asked these questions until quite recently? So I went with this objective, you know what, I'm going to sit with my grandmother, I'm going to spend time asking her about her story. And when I did, I got a surprising and uncomfortable response, which was, I have no story to tell. And so it just hit me in my gut that I have also inherited this narrative in many ways of, I have no story to tell who is going to be interested in my story. And this has been an inheritance that I didn't ask for, an inheritance that has been passed on from one generation of women to the next. And so one of my questions has been, how do I be an ancestor in training? And that's a term coined by one of my favorite poets, um, Mr. Mark Gonzalez, who wrote a book called In Times of T terror, wage beauty. And in that, he asks this question, what does it mean to be an ancestor in training? So what are we taking with us? And what do we need to leave behind? And so my most recent collection, Reminders on the Path, explores these questions. What are the things we are taking with us? And what are the things we are leaving behind? And this first poem speaks to that moment where my grandmother answered in a way I wasn't expecting. Lost Daughters. A mound of clay hardens in the corner of your heart, cracking into a hoarse whisper. Nothing I have is worth telling. Silence is the gift of our forefathers, the sludge of shame snaking through our veins, muscles, tendons, until we no longer hear the echoes of home in our own bodies. Did you whisper too softly in my DNA? I ask you to tell me your story. You frown, jowls tighten. Nothing I have is worth telling. I didn't ask for this inheritance. So the next poem is called Salt. And I 
I haven't been back to my, my ancestral homeland, um, which is Kutch and Gujarat, India. I've been to India before, but never made it back to Gujarat. We don't have any family there anymore. And so, so much of my envisioning of it is frozen in time and is dreamlike and quite probably far from the reality. And I just remember having this dream. I, I woke up feeling completely supported by all my ancestors. And so the dream was just this very simple vision uh, that I was standing in the run of Kutch, which is a salt marsh. Uh, and behind me, I could feel thousands of my ancestors standing, not speaking, just standing with me. And so that first image is what called me to write this poem. And then when I sat with my grandmother and I asked her more questions and she finally opened up to me, she told me something, again, completely unexpected, which was that her mother left home, left India at the age of 17 and never saw her mother again. And because uh, she couldn't travel, she had you know, um, some health issues that prevented her from that. She wasn't able to go to her, grand her mother's deathbed, but her sister did. And her sister sat with her mother and her mother said, I will never see my daughter in this lifetime again, but maybe in the next. And that just stays with you. And so I also wonder how those narratives have seeped into my bones and my blood uh, and maybe consciously or unconsciously informed the words that come out of my mouth. So this is salt. Thousands stand behind me, ashen statues bracing the wind, holding stillness like a vow. Bellowing saris, white shells against the moon, starched turbans, white feather against the night. A ghost light flickers with the Morse code of, we never left. I trace the dust of bloodlines, brow bones, and jaw lines. We have broken the inked silk of the run, crossing this terrain for centuries. What use is a map? Your heartbeat is the compass. The edge of my great grandmother's pacheri is as sharp as the memory of her leaving. The folds of her mother's wrinkles pressed into the seams of her shawl. A pouch of cloves, shakar, darya, sewn into her sleeve. If I could plunge my hand into the ocean of that time, I'd dredge for what was thrown overboard, for who was left behind. I'd bring the salt to my lips to remember what forgetting tastes like. Great grandmother, did you say goodbye? Did you know there would never be a return? A lullaby sung across generations a pang of separation in the bones, a spoon of curd melting on the tongue, a growl rising from the gut. This, this is how we say goodbye. The next poem is called Jinatsi. Again, my great grandmother came to me in a dream, and uh, this speaks to those inheritances not limited to the tangible. Great grandmother comes to me in a dream, her eyes grayer than the steel of the waves before us. She hunches over the sand, fistful of something I can't see. She pours the contents into a pouch and hands it to me. 
My palm weighs down with the heaviness of river rocks. Flick, flick as they hit the sand. Flick, flick as we read their scatterings. Each rock is a question I can't answer. She turns to me, pressing her gnarled finger against my chest. It's your turn now. Which are burdens and which are anchors? Which are burdens and which are anchors? I think that last question has become a question I keep returning to in my own life, not limited to the page, but extended beyond it, beyond it in my own practice. So, and uh, as I had mentioned, my family is from a town, it used to be a small town, not now, not so much. Uh, it's grown quite a bit and it's in Rift Valley, in the Rift Valley region of Kenya. And so these next two poems are poems of place and poems of observation of being in my grandmother's garden and sitting and observing and also acknowledging that there are many um, trees and plants and flowers that I thought were native to East Africa and they are not so they were brought over by colonialism for example eucalyptus trees which actually take in a lot of groundwater and they can contribute to drought which is something I didn't realize because whenever I go to Kenya to my grandmother's garden I'm always um, drawn to that eucalyptus tree and it feels like home and yet it's also a stranger um, and then the jacaranda trees which have become synonymous with uh, Nairobi streets you know just being lined with these purple flowers they're also uh, the result of colonialism. So interesting when we question what we think we know. Speaking of which, Rift Valley Song. What did you know before you knew it? Soil redder than my blood swept into steep embankments. The smooth bark of a eucalyptus tree its giraffe's hide of marbled green, gold, and rust. The pied crow folded between the moon and night, a half shadow ringed with light. Drapes of weeping bottle brush, prickles of red sweeping the soil in the mid-noon breeze. Pomegranate still hanging from trees, broken open into empty shells, their rubies pierced by sharp beaks, the click clack of silver dusted ficus leaves hitting the ground, felled by their own decay. A line of fire ants crawling under my pollen stained shirt, every sting a reminder that I am indeed alive. Shadows of vultures darkening the view from the ground as I collect half eaten berries discarded by mouse birds. I left you when the jacaranda were in half bloom, a half fist of a heart opening and closing with the sound of your voice. Night falls over itself and stars scatter into street lights. I sit at the cliff edge of this poem and ask the valley where to find the words for it. In tumbled rocks, and chickweed. So Rift Valley Song 2 is um, about something, well, I guess it's based on something that I read, an article I read that the Rift Valley will eventually become an ocean um, years and years and years, well, thousands of years from now. And so it made me think about memory and how memories can be washed away, not only in our minds, but also on the land. Uh, and what that does that mean for what we remember and what we choose to forget? Rift Valley Song 2. What will be remembered 
when you are forgotten. A prick of acacia thorn, the four-note call of Hadada, cape honeysuckle falling over itself, Mabati roofs in the gaze of a midday sun, flies hovering over warmed hides of lean cows, the crackle of charcoal fires sparking embers into twilight. When we are thousands of years into dust, you will split open into a rift sea. Cattle bones settling at the bottom of a new ocean, glass beads swirling into rainbow whirlpools, whale so song drowning out hill song, memory washed clean by wefts of waves. In our forgetting, becoming. Thank you. Wonderful. Oh, just wonderful. I have to get my video on here. <laughs> Thank you so much, Shanice. That was absolutely amazing. Um, great juxtaposition between the two poets and their perspectives on uh, colonial pasts and uh, reconstructing, deconstructing memory, who we are, how we came here, and all of that. And wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to remind everyone that we are now entering the question and answer period. So if you can put any uh, questions into the chat, that would be just great. Um, please do ask away. Um, these question and answer uh, sessions are always so rich. We get good questions from our audience and amazing answers from our poets. So with that, I will hand it over to our dear Laura Farina to pose questions to the poets. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. I feel like I should have warned you off the top. We get really good questions. Here's one for you both. It's from Renee. She wants to know, can you share a bit about your research process as it relates to your generation creative process for making poems? For example, what comes first? Do you leave time between research and writing or does it happen sort of organically all at once? Anyone want to take a stab at that? Sure. I mean, for me, I think it happens kind of organically at the same time. I think of poetry as, like I said earlier, kind of like education in a way, a way to theorize the self. And like, I think, you know, there's a lot of, when a poem's working for me, it's when it has discovery in it, when you're discovering something in the process of writing it. Um, and so research is similar. And so the discoveries that happen in research and the discoveries that happen while writing about the research, um, that interrelationship is important, at least for me. Um, Though, you know, often when it comes to writing about like memory and place, I have to be somewhat kind of like removed from it to see it more clearly. Um, I really was able to write better about Canada after spending more time in the States. <laughs> what about you, Shanice? Yeah, I agree. It is an organic process for me as well. And I think it also depends on the poems. Um, so for example, with Salt, which was the first poem I read, I've never been to Kutch. Uh, so I needed to root the imagery in um, authenticity of place. So I had to do some research. And I, that's where I found out that there are these ghost lights, apparently, in the middle of the night that, that um, yeah, confound people. And it's, so that was really fascinating to me. And I don't know if I would have included that had I not done the research, if it was all based on imagination. So I do think it's absolutely part and parcel of the um, process. And I can't really separate the two. It's not that I sit down and do research and then uh, write the poems. It's more, um, what do I need? And, or what does a poem need? And that might require research. Awesome. I would love to hear Renee's answer to that question. <laughs> <laughs> Renee, so you, wanna, you wanna answer your question? That's so generous. I don't really know. I vacillate between um, being actually fairly rigorous in the world building I'm doing for the epic fantasy and verse right now, which is so massive. 
Um, and I'm, I'm struggling with it actually, um, how to get back into that organic poetry making. I'm now on book two. So that's very generous of you to ask. I have been transfixed by both of you. It is such an honor to have heard your readings, how professionally you've prepared and read, and then the quality of your responses. I'll mute now and we've got lots of great questions. Thank you both so very much. Uh, so our next question comes from Whitney. She says, uh, you were both, uh, you, you both are unearthing intense intergenerational memory as poets who I've heard are sensitive craftspeople. How do you decompress or practice self-care in your writing? And then she has so much, she wanted to convey that she has so much respect for you both. I can start, I guess. Um, hi, Whitney. Thanks for being here. Whitney is also an incredible writer in her own right. So definitely check out Whitney French writes. Um, we have to support each other, right? And I, I think for me, yeah, there are some places that I couldn't go. And sometimes you lean into that and sometimes you choose not to. And it's okay. It doesn't necessarily mean that I won't return to those pieces. I also find that having parents who are private, uh, like my mom's a little bit better about that, but my dad has told me in very clear terms don't write about me and he he has the most incredible stories and so um i have to honor that and that's a constant negotiation also just even the fact that you know when my grandmother reads these poems what is she going to to think or say so yeah i think it's sitting with the reality that we are part of community we're not writing in silos and what are the responsibilities to that. But at the same time, how do we still serve the work that needs to be served? And uh, that, that varies from poem to poem for me again, right? Like I might choose not to publish something at this moment for those reasons. Uh, but sometimes it's because the next generation or the generation ahead of me is like, we need to ask these questions. And then it's like, okay, am I willing to hold that? Uh, and then how do I hold space for myself through that process? Yeah. I mean, I, I agree with everything she was just said, which was so well articulated and, and deeply thoughtful about it all. I mean, when I talk with my students about this on like the level of the page, I talk about how form can be a kind of armor, you know, and how the silences in a poem have to be as loud as the words in some ways, right? You can write around things, you can, you can, you can create you know, spaces in the poem that allow, you know, the difficult things to resonate without having actually to, to, to write right into them yourself. Um, but in terms of like thinking about what I put in, keep out of my poems, I mean, I agree with Shanice. I, there was a wonderful um, part of the correspondence between Robert Lowell and Elizabeth Bishop, where Lowell has like made these poems uh, out of like, kind of like, he's created these sonnets out of the letters between him and his ex-wife while they're going through a divorce. And he shows the poems to Bishop and she goes, don't publish these, <laughs> you know, art just isn't worth that much. You're going to hurt too many people. Um, Lowell, of course, being Lowell did publish them, but he lost a lot of friends. And I side with Bishop, you know, I write from a place of love and respect for my family and the communities I'm in. And I always want to honor that. Um, you know, I, when I was writing my first book, it ends with a very long poem about going to visit all the internment campsites in British Columbia with my grandfather. Um, and we drove around for two weeks and did this. Um, and I wrote a first draft of the poem, um, and then I ended up taking out a lot because I didn't want to hurt his feelings. Um, and my editor was very unhappy with me. He said, this will be a better poem with these things in, but I said, I can't do it. And I'm, you know, you have to be able to sleep at night. <laughs> and in terms of like going forward, I try and write, I'm trying to write more to, about joy now as a way to like bolster myself during these very difficult times, <laughs> which is something you wouldn't know from my reading, but I am I'm trying to do it. <laughs> Um, I think we have time for one more question and uh, Fiona Lamb wants to know, uh, can you please talk about the role of your writing mentors in crafting, shaping and honing your poems, the poems that you read today? Um, I mean, I owe everything to my mentors. <laughs> you know, I have, I've had like a series of really wonderful mentors. I wouldn't be writing without my mentors. Um, you know, and I've been, I was lucky enough to, 
to learn in, in grad school that sometimes the people you least expect to be your best readers will end up being your best readers in the long run. Um, and I've been, I've been very lucky in that regard. I, you know, so I teach creative writing and I teach Asian American literature, but one of the things I try to be conscious of is the ways in which workshop fails, you know, and the classroom fails in many ways, right? It especially fails students of color, you know, students from, from marginalized and like disadvantaged groups historically. Um, and one of the things, you know, that I think compensates for the failures of the classroom is good mentorship, right? And there are many ways that can be accomplished. So, so yeah, I, I owe them everything. Thank you for that, Michael. That yes, workshop fails. <laughs> and I think starting there, we can do something about it, right? With that first acknowledging that. Um, I think for me too, I, I wouldn't be where I was without my, my mentors, and I wouldn't be able to mentor other students without their guidance and support. And I think mentors don't have to be limited to the creative mentorship. Uh, because as we all know, there are intersections between life and writing and creativity. And so they all kind of feed into each other. Uh, so I do have a teacher who mentors me in life, but how that unravels on the page is very um, clear. Uh, but my first mentors were all South Asian women poets. And just having that, I didn't real, realize how rare it was uh, until being in this position myself and now realizing how much uh, people from the next you know the generations ahead of me need this and so my first mentor was cool deep gill uh you know bc poet and incredible incredibly generous uh mentor as well and she taught me how to stick to form before i could break form and so it was honoring these traditions first and understanding why is it that I'm confronting them um, and what am I confronting them for, right? And so that's something that's ever present when I'm working with uh, students as well. So they live on, they live on. Thank you so much for these thoughtful and generous answers. Um, I'm gonna pass it over to Renee, who's gonna end uh, our, our, our reading for today. Renee? My dear friend, Laura, you are just the best. Andrew, Kieran, and of course, these thoughtful, talented, generous, well-presented poets. You've raised the bar today, and I am so grateful. I'm so grateful to all the audience, their incredible questions and support. Wow, in these troubled times, I don't have to list all of that. It is an absolute honor that you busy, important poets would take time for us out here in the West Coast. And you've been pitch perfect, as have been my colleagues. Kim, your labor always so appreciated. And I thought Andrew, Kieran and Laura, the way that we were started today, it just clicked. And then the presentation skills of both of you, giving me a lot to think about with words and visuals and the way you introduced your poems. I just want to end by saying next month we'll actually be in person downtown SFU and I'm going out a little bit on a curatorial limb where I've invited two basically spoken word poets, although they now have books out, R.C. Wesloski, who's kind of a known entity, and um, his colleague, um, I forget her first name, uh, Lucia, Lucia Mish, and they will be both in person in June. And just another reminder that do check out these poets' books. We've posted their links in the chat. Their publishers will thank you. And what have I missed? I always think I missed something. <laughs> Aw, this is very special. And as a Gujarati, part Gujarati, part Marathi person, and it was, yeah. And then, of course, the docu poetics of uh, of Burning Province, which is unbelievably good. Both of you, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks for the readings. It's lovely seeing you, Shanice and Michael. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Have a good day. <laughs>